Thank you, Mark. We have come to the last lesson in 1 Thessalonians, and our text is chapter 5, verses 12 through 18. Paul is now come to the end of his letter, and he has a number of things he wants to communicate to them. And so it's an interesting passage from that perspective. It's 17 verses, and there are probably are 17 ideas contained in it, not all in apparent connection with one another. So as you think about it, 17 ideas, and really probably more than that, is a lot to contain in one's mind. One can get lost uh, with all of that. So I tried to think of a, a verse that might summarize it all, and, or I mean a statement, and... Um, well, the Christian life would do that because that's what he's describing here, but that's a little too general. So what I came up with was uh, selfless serving by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. I think that helps summarize everything, but you, you be the judge. Let's read beginning with verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Princeton theologian Benjamin B. Warfield is maybe best known for his defense of the inerrant, inerrancy and authority of the Bible. It is God's Word. His revelation is the guide for our lives. And because that is true, Warfield was fond of saying that believing and obeying Scripture will always be safe. And as Paul now comes to the end of the book of 1 Thessalonians, he concludes with a series of exhortations that direct us and assure us of the safe life. But it's, while safe, not easy. In fact, Paul's exhortations like, don't take vengeance, rejoice always, abstain from every form of evil is a righteous way, but a very high standard. Who can rejoice always? But then in the middle of all this instruction is Paul's prayer in verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. I'm reminded of Augustine's prayer in his confessions. My God set me aflame. Give what you command and command what you will. God is at work in us. He gives us a high standard. But then He gives what He commands so that we can walk 
this righteous way as we look to the Lord and live by faith. It is challenging, but it is good and will always be safe. These final verses of 1 Thessalonians, verses 12 through 28, divide into three parts. First is a series of exhortations, and then his prayer in verse 23, and then final greeting. Some have seen in the instructions Paul gives on their conduct a sign of trouble in the church that Paul needed to correct. And I suppose that's possible, but I don't think that's a necessary way to see this. In fact, the brevity of each statement, the fact that Paul doesn't elaborate on them, suggests there wasn't a problem. That this wasn't corrective, but this was more preemptive to forestall any future problems, all of which he describes here it would be very common and probably would surface in that church as they do in most churches. There are four issues of potential problems Paul addresses. The first has to do with the congregation and the respect it is to have for church leaders, for the elders. That's how he begins in verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. These elders were likely simple men, as were most of those in the, in the early church. They weren't from the higher station of society and not from positions of authority. So Paul could see that people might have difficulty following their leadership. Or possibly some were actually resisting it. So Paul instructs the congregation to appreciate the leaders. It is respect first for the position, for the office but also respect that is to be earned. Elders are to be men who diligently labor among us. And those in Thessalonica did that. The words labor, have charge, and give instruction are present participles. And the importance of that present tense is that it shows durative action. So it indicates that they don't carry out their responsibilities sporadically, but are at it continually. This is what characterizes their ministry among the saints. Give instruction means give admonition, give correction. And that's done from Scripture. So it is teaching, but teaching that is intended to correct and direct. That is shepherding the flock. It's not authoritarianism. They're not dictators and that uh, make declarations and, and do so with uh, this kind of uh, authority. These are men who, who um, are exhibiting the Lord in what they do. Ideally, and I think these men in Thessalonica were, but ideally that's what it is because they're described as as ministering in the Lord, which simply means they are believers. But because they're in the Lord, they are uh, exhibiting His life and His character. And being in Him, they would then work with warmth and care. That's the way the ministry should be carried out, with earnestness, with care, with warmth, as I say. Now, they're said to have charge over the flock, which literally means they stand before. That's the idea in this word, stand before. But I, I take that to mean they stand before others as examples. So Paul says in verse 13, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Again, first of all, because of their position, honor that, but also because of what they do in that role and the example that they give. The, the church cannot function well if those who govern or shepherd are resisted by the congregation. You can't, can't, can't function well if these individuals are not carrying out their responsibilities. But assuming they are, in order for it 
the church to function well, the, the congregation must follow the lead of the shepherds. This is not a problem that was uh, strictly limited to Thessalonica, and I don't know that it was a problem when he was writing this, but it certainly is a potential problem. And I say that because at the end of the book of uh, Hebrews, the author gives the same kind of exhortation in chapter 13 and verse 17. He writes, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. You want joyful leaders. That's profitable for everyone. I think that's the idea here. That's what Paul is also exhorting the Thessalonians to do. Paul, Paul ends the verse, live in peace with one another. That's Paul's concern. Peace in the church. Unity of purpose. We need to support one another to do that, and we need to support one another to do that in prayer. After all, the work of the ministry in the church is not limited to the elders or the deacons or to the teachers. It is the responsibility of everyone. I think we've stressed that many times, and I think that's the stress you see, for example, in 1 Corinthians when Paul talks about the church in chapters 12 through 14. We have gifts. We're all to be using them and to be functioning in the ministry. And so in the next verses, Paul speaks to the whole congregation. Verse 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the ruly, rather the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. That's everyone's responsibility to everyone. The unruly is a, a military term. It describes soldiers who step out of rank or an army that is marching in disarray. And the word came to refer to idleness or loafing. Evidently, Paul had seen this as a problem among them because later in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, he reminds them of a command that he gave. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. So Paul tells them to take steps to end laziness. I, the fact that he says he referred to that earlier uh, when he writes that in 2 Thessalonians indicates that it really took place before he wrote 1 Thessalonians. He gave that exhortation, I assume, when he was there in Thessalonica when the church began. And he must have seen this as a problem uh, among these young believers, a, a characteristic of the old life that they brought over in the new life. And of course, that's true of all of us. We bring a lot of the old life into the new life, and that's where sanctification comes in. And so he's warning them against that. He's warning them against this problem of laziness. The, the church is to be generous with those in need, but not allow people to be slack. Uh, we are to be industrious. That, that is an important witness to the world. Grace makes workers of us. It, it, it turns the church into a well-disciplined army that marches uh, in step and with purpose, with a discipline that uh, should be characteristic of all of us. So we're to be, we're to be careful about, uh, about these things. We're to admonish the unruly. But uh, we're also to show much grace and mercy and be an encouragement to those who are discouraged. Wisdom enables us to do that properly. Wisdom enables us to respond to each circumstance according to what is required. It, it, one thing is not required in each circumstance. Circumstances and people's issues deal, uh, differ from person to person, situation to situation. Wisdom gives us the right perspective, a right analysis of things so that we know what is required for that particular moment and issue. Uh, being kind and sympathetic is what's called for as well as being firm with individuals. And this kindness is also a witness to the world. It should see that in us. 
These are necessary virtues of the Christian and the kind of help that people need in order to continue on in the Christian faith, in order to help us to persevere in the faith. It was one of the Lord's virtues that was extolled and prophesied in Isaiah 42.3. It was prophesied of the Messiah that a bruised reed he will not break, and that in, in the Gospels is applied to our Lord. And we're to be like that. We are to be patient with everyone, Paul says. And that leads to the instruction of verse 15. We are not to retaliate when wronged, and we're to discourage retaliation from others. We are to seek the good of others, not their harm. Now, that's hard to do. That's hard to do, especially when we have been offended, when we've been wronged. But in our own country, we have examples of the dangers of not doing that, uh, of not seeking peace with... Uh, a storied history of blood feuds. We're all familiar with the Hatfield and McCoy feud, but there were quarrels like that all over the uh, Appalachian Mountains. Uh, Breathitt County in Kentucky is known as Bloody Breathitt. And I have uh, read about this in a couple of different books that I've read rather recently. This county has come up. And these feuds that occur begin for reasons like killing a neighbor's cow or accusing a person of cheating at cards and the list goes on. But things quickly go from bad to worse, from heated words to fatal gunshots. Several dozens of people are killed in a cycle of violence that, that stretches over decades, generations. Well, sociologists have studied that and they've studied that county evidently and they have called the cause of it, of these feuds, a culture of honor. Uh, people believe that their reputation is sacred and an and insult has to be answered with violence. They have to protect their honor. And uh, who, who can't, at least to some degree, sympathize with that? Our name is important. Our reputation is important. But the danger of following one's instincts is, is huge, and the consequences are often catastrophic. Paul has a better way, a calmer, reasonable way. Be patient with everyone, he writes. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. That's hard to do. Because repaying evil for evil is the natural thing and what we want to do. But following Paul's instruction, following God's will is better. It's best. And it will always be safe. Really, Paul's instruction is only another version of Christ's teaching in his model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. We need to be forgiving. But that means putting others first, and that's hard to do. In fact, humanly speaking, that's impossible. That's why the power of God's grace must be at work in us to do it. And it is in the Christian, this power, creating in us the character of Christ who endured insults and injuries of wicked men. He's a great example. And it's his character that's being infused into us. That's the work of sanctification, of changing our character. That uh, It's what Paul speaks of in that prayer in verse 23. It's supernatural. But the channel of grace is faith. Believing God's word and obeying it. Stepping out in faith against the circumstances and maybe our natural desires. It's trusting in Him. It, it, you know, it's that simple. It's that hard. But that's the life of faith. Trusting God and acting on it. 
It's what those early Christians did. Leon Morris wrote of this in his commentary. He wrote that such a precept, and he's speaking here of forgiveness, was so widely accepted in a body subject to such constant ill treatment as the early church is remarkable enough that it was put into practice to such a large extent is even more so. It may be that this was responsible in some measure for the impact the early Christians made on the men of their day. Well, I don't doubt that that is the case, that that is a reason for the great influence that the church had in those early years. The, the consequence of a culture of honor is death. The results of a culture of grace is life and blessing. Paul continues, instead of being injured and angry, we are to have joy. He says in verse 16, rejoice always. Don't nurse grudges or allow yourself to be eaten up with, with, with anger and envy. I don't want to sound glib. I don't want to brush over this easily because this also is a difficult command. People suffer great injustices. You think of the, of the Christians, those early Christians that uh, Morris is referring to. or Go back to the book of Hebrews. And uh, think of what they suffered, what he describes there uh, as of what they had suffered. The loss of their property, the loss of their freedom. Many of them had been put in jail for their faith. The, the writer says of them, they endured a great conflict of sufferings. The Christians have down through the ages. Some still are. You read about the Christians in Nigeria and the horrific Persecution they are presently suffering. We've, we, we escape that here in the West. But we do have minor sufferings, we could say, compared to that. Nevertheless, they, they are still difficult. But this is not optional, what Paul is saying here. We must do it. We must rejoice. That's the instruction. But what helps us rejoice in the difficulties of life is knowing that it all fits within God's sovereign plan. We may not understand it, but we can know that by faith that God has ordered things and this has a purpose and a place. And we can rejoice in the midst of it because of that. And knowing that it's only temporary. And He will more than replace what has been taken from us someday. And, and as we do that, Act in faith and rejoice. He supplies the grace to do it. And the grace not only to endure it and get through it, but to rejoice. To live a contented life. So the next exhortation follows naturally and necessarily, pray without ceasing. Prayer is a real source of help and power and means of change. It's one of the the means of sanctification that God has given to us. And we can see the power of it throughout the Scriptures. In, in Acts 4, for example, Peter and John were arrested for preaching the gospel and were warned by the high court, by the Sanhedrin, not to preach Christ again. And they threatened them just to make sure they wouldn't do it. And what did they do? Well, they left and they went to the church and they recounted what happened to the church. And the church prayed with one mind, we're told, in unity. They addressed God as the Lord and Maker of all creation who rules over the Jews and Gentiles. In other words, they addressed Him as the sovereign God of all things, of every circumstance. And then they prayed in Acts 4 verse 29, And now, Lord, take note of their threats. And if we didn't read on, we might expect to hear them say, and break them with your rod of iron and scatter them like dust. But they don't. They pray, they pray, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Make us bold, in spite of these threats, to speak grace to others. 
That is not a culture of honor. And he answered their prayers. The room, we're, we're told, shook. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. They prayed. We need to believe in prayer and pray without ceasing. When we pray according to His will and not our selfish instincts, He answers. And He may even, he may even shake up the place. He may use us greatly. The Lord promises always to be with us, so we need to look to Him always. Make our concerns known to Him. Bear our souls to Him. Ask Him for help and be thankful for all that He has done for us and all that He will still do for us. Now that is the next injunction or the next command given in verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The, the natural man, the unbelieving, unregenerate, person is dependent on circumstances for his or her happiness in life. Along the way, there, there are things that make him happy. There are things that cause him to be sad, to be unhappy, cause bitterness. This life is all that he or she has. That's not so for believers in Christ. We know life is momentary. It is only the, the threshold to glory and reward. Christ has saved us eternally. And in the present, hardship even works for our good. That's Romans 8.28. So we can rejoice and be thankful. We can if we have that perspective on things. We are not victims of the bludgeonings of chance. God has a purpose in all that happens to us, as difficult as it may be, as confusing as it may be. And we may not understand why something has come into our life and why something happens to us or to our family. We don't see the reason of it, but God knows the reason. He's ordered everything according to His wisdom. And sometimes we do get to see the purpose of it all. In the hiding place, <clears throat> Corey Ten Boom recalls an incident when she learned this, and learned it the hard way, when she and her sister were taken to Ravensbrück, which was uh, a German concentration camp. The day they arrived, they read this passage, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. They read, in everything give thanks. Well, they entered this place and it was overcrowded and it was infested with fleas. But her sister Betsy told her, give thanks for their circumstances. Well, only after constant encouragement from her sister did Corey finally begin to rejoice and give thanks. As the months passed, they found that they could read their Bibles freely and conduct Bible studies and prayer meetings without the guards interfering. Later, they learned that they could do that openly because the guards didn't want to come into the barracks from fear of being infested with fleas. So God can bring a blessing out of a curse. He can even marshal the, free, the, the fleas and make them into a, an army of defense. He will do that. So we're not to resist His providence. We're not to complain against His will. That leads Paul to Paul's instruction, in, uh, to Paul's instruction in verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. If you have the New International Version, it, it has, do not put out the Spirit's fire. It's a nice translation, but fire is not in the text, and I don't think that it, it's a necessary way of stating it. The idea is simple. Don't stifle or suppress the Spirit. And we can do that by, by not rejoicing or not being thankful. That fits the immediate context. But in view of what follows in verse 20, Paul's warning not to despise prophetic utterances, 
his instruction in verse 19 may more precisely be related to that. At, at a time when the New Testament was incomplete, prophets were active in the church, giving God's revelation. Paul speaks of this in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 29 and 30. He speaks of it to some larger degree in that passage. You have example, for example, in uh, Acts 21 of Agabus, the prophet, coming down from Jerusalem to speak to Paul and, and those with him. Prophets were active in the early church, and they were the same in the New Testament as they were in the Old Testament. And, and just as Paul was instructing the Thessalonians to respect and appreciate their leaders, so too he was instructing them to submit to those who gave prophecy. In other words, to obey God's word. When people didn't, when they treated God's prophets with contempt and, and rejected God's revelation, they suppressed the Spirit's work which would result in a lack of peace and a lack of order in the church. The canon today is complete, which is to say the Bible is finished. All 66 chapters are the extent of the revelation God has given us, and it is sufficient in and of itself. So we, have, we don't have prophets any longer, but we have the scriptures. And we're to guard them. And we're to obey them. When we don't, there will be no peace and order in the church. So Paul wrote in verse 20 and 21, do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. In other words, Christians are not to be gullible. Paul said in verses 19 and 20, or what he said there might be misapplied as accept everything that passes itself off as a prophecy or accept everyone who passes himself or herself off as a prophet. So Paul warns against that. We are to examine all claims. That means to, to prove them, like testing and proving metal to see if it is really true, if it's really gold or silver. And we do that with the scriptures. We do that with teaching. Uh, that's what Jesus did. He, he used the scriptures to do that. That's the, that's the test by which we can tell if something is genuine or not. It's the word of God. You remember the, the Bereans, how Paul spoke of them. He'd gone from Thessalonica down to Berea. And he spoke of the Brians as being more noble than the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians. And the reason is because they examined everything. They listened to what he said and they examined it with Scripture and came to the conclusion, you're right, Paul, and they believed. And as I said, that is what Christ himself did when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and, and tempted by the devil. He faced that challenge as a man in his humanity, his human nature, and responded as a man, a woman, a person ought to respond. When the devil quoted the Bible, the Lord answered, on the other hand, it is written. That's how we correct, or he corrected, an abuse of Scripture and error, and it's how we're to do it as well. So we need to know the Bible and how to apply it. That's what makes a sound theologian and a wise Christian. And every wise Christian is a sound theologian. In fact, I would say every Christian is a theologian. You just may not be a very good one. If you want to be a good theologian, understand the Word of God and how it applies. And when we do that, we will hold fast to that which is good. We'll hold fast to the truth and live by it. Finally, Paul tells them in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. I say finally, this is the final part of this first division of the book with all these exhortations. Abstain from every form of evil. Well, we could devote a whole sermon to that. In fact, we could do a whole series of sermons on, on that. But uh, I think we know what evil is and how this is to be applied to us. Abstain from it. Having concluded his exhortations, Paul prays for them, which 
again, is a natural sequence because the only way they could follow his instruction is by God's power. So he prays that this will happen. He prays to the God of peace in verse 23. That, that is what he is seeking for the Thessalonians and all the churches. He's seeking peace for them. Only in the Lord and by the Lord would they or will we have the peace of the Lord. They were believers in Jesus Christ. They had peace with God. Every person who's put his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in His sacrifice for salvation, has peace with God. We are at that moment reconciled to God. The war is over. But the, they, we, need the peace of God. That's what the Thessalonians needed. Peace in their own lives, peace with one another, peace in the church. That leads to prosperity. Not necessarily material prosperity, but spiritual prosperity. Again, that would occur as they followed Paul's instruction. But they could only do that in the power of God. So he prays in verse 23, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has had a lot to say about sanctification throughout the letter. So it's not surprising he comes back to it as he comes to the close of the letter. As we have noted before, the, the main idea in sanctification is being set apart for God. Set apart to His service. Set apart to a life with Him. But it is also about actually changing us spiritually, morally, mentally. It is about conforming us to the image of Christ. Sanctif sanctification involves us in the process and the goal of it, which Paul says here is perfection, being without blame. That's what we are to long for. That's what we're to strive for. We're involved in this process. And we do that. We strive for it. We involve ourselves in it through obedience to God's Word. But the primary agent in sanctification is the Holy Spirit. He's the first cause. He supplies us the power that we need to obey. He even gives us the desire for change and incentive to strive. Still, we must strive. So Paul's prayer is that God will do this. He will bring it about in them. Make it happen in them. That He will sanctify them, sanctify us for that matter. We are dependent upon the Lord to do that. That, that's what Jesus said in John chapter 15, 1 through 6, with the analogy of the vine and the branches. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. You can't bear any kind of fruit if you're not in the vine. And so we must be in him, first of all, and we must be looking to him continually, always. Paul's prayer is that the Lord would do this entirely for the Thessalonians. That's, that's the goal of sanctification in, in all our parts <clears throat> as people, being made holy, complete, um, in, in, in quantity and quality. It's extensive and it is to be a, a change in our character completely. Uh, Paul repeats the prayer in the second half of the verse, making clear what he means by entirely. He prays that they would be preserved, complete, without blame, in spirit and soul and body. Well, that's the whole man. That's what Paul stresses. So, for example, the body is to be sanctified. The body is important. It's God's temple and it's to be treated well. That's 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. 
We are to maintain our health as best we can. Uh, that's part of it. But I think the most important aspect of the body in sanctification is we're to use it to God's glory and service. So Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 12, 12 and 13, that we are not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies, but present our members, uh, all the parts of our body, our eyes, our ears, our hands, our feet, everything, to present them to the Lord as instruments of righteousness. That can be translated as weapons for righteousness. We're to, to dedicate every aspect of our life to His service, materially, physically. But again, the power to do this is of the Spirit. Paul stresses that here. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely. And the emphasis there is on that word Himself. So this is not an unattainable goal. All of the injunctions, all the instruction He gives here is not unattainable. This is what we are to long for, what we are to strive for, what we're to be looking for by looking to the Lord and living in obedience to Him, which we do when we walk by faith dependent on Him. In that way, change occurs gradually, progressively. That's 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, that we are being changed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another, transformed from glory to glory. As we read the Word of God, study it, God transforms our lives. Now, perfection is not our, going to be our possession now uh, and won't be in this life, this side of the grave, but Paul indicates when it will be completed, and he says, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's when it will be complete. We go to be with the Lord. If you were to go to be with the Lord tonight, you would be whole and complete in your soul and spirit, but there's still the body. And that will be complete in the resurrection. And that occurs at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which may be soon. We don't know. Maybe tonight. But in the meantime, we strive for the goal. And as we do, change occurs and eventually the goal will be reached completely and finally. Paul, in fact, ends his prayer with that confidence in verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you and he will bring it to pass. That's a triumphant statement. God finishes what he begins. He doesn't call us and then drop us. He will perfect each of us. That's the guarantee of salvation and glorification. It's the assurance of our security forever, eternal security. And in the present, as we walk obediently, we will always be safe. Not because of what's in us, not because of our wisdom, knowledge, or strength, but because of Him. Altogether because of Him. He, as Paul said, is faithful. Paul concludes the letter with some final requests. Verse 25, brethren, pray for us. Paul knew his limitations and weaknesses and uh, often asked the saints to pray for him. It's kind of an amazing thing when you consider this. What, he said, what, we, what we see here is none of us is so mature and so advanced in the faith that we don't need to seek the prayers of others and even seek the prayers of the, the simplest saints. Paul the Apostle asked these Thessalonians, these new believers, to pray for him. He needed their prayers, as we all need one another's prayers. Verse 26, Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That Paul would pray that Christ's grace would be with them shows that Christ is the source of grace and that is a proof of His deity. So what Paul indicated in the first, book of this, uh, first verse of this book showing 
that the Lord Jesus is equal with God the Father. Those are his words. He shows now in the last verse. Christ, like the Father, is the source of grace. And therefore, that means he is God. Not God the Father, he's God the Son. All glory goes to him. All glory, Paul is saying, really goes to the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He, the triune God, is for us. And he will sanctify us entirely, body, soul, and spirit, when he comes for us. Until then, he gives us the safe life. Is that your life? Under the rule of the triune God? If not... Your situation is desperate, more so than you know. Come to Him. Believe in Christ as Savior who died in the place of sinners so that all who believe in Him are forgiven and saved. And then may we all, by His grace, be serving selflessly by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. Why don't we conclude with hymn number 16 in the Songs of Praise book. He, Father, what a great truth that is. That he will hold me fast. It's not because we're worthy of it. It's because of what He did on the cross. Satisfied your justice completely for every sin that we could ever commit you're satisfied with the work of your son on the cross and now we're held fast and can never be lost. Thank you, Father, for that great truth and in light of that great truth, may it move us to live lives of selfless service for you and for one another. That brings great glory to you. May we do that. And may we do that in Christ's name. Amen.